We need a cold open. Well, we don't really know when we're on. I mean, it could, it could, we, could, we could be on at any time. Well, guys, thanks for having me. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you have that, you have that written, pre-written? It looks like I'm written, writing, reading off the screen. Cool. Yeah, it does. It does. <laughs> the Society of the Spectacle. What is it? I don't know. I, I read a bit of that book. And I, I think it was a lot denser than I thought it'd be. I got JJ to read that book. Yeah? Yeah. I got to take another crack at it. Well, thank you for having me here. I don't know where here is, though, because... It's kind of a liminal space. Do we have a name? For the studio? For the podcast. <laughs> Horseshoe Theory. Horseshoe Theory Podcast. But the oh, name of the studio is the course. CCCRU. And you have thoughts about that. Yeah, we don't do enough uh, speed. I agree. Would you like to do speed with us? I'd like to see how you guys take speed, you know, your approach, and then mm -hmm. maybe I'll adopt, adopt the method. Yeah. You, met, you, you mentioned um, that there was this other group that with Marshall McLuhan was in. Oh, yeah. I thought this was fitting because, as opposed to the CCRU mm. British, the Toronto School of Communications theory is... Uh, Marshall McLuhan was, like, the guy who blew up from it, but it was kind of a bigger movement about people studying the effect of text mm. on the mind in Toronto, down the mm. street. So... That is it's, much, a, it's not very well known, though. Yeah. Did you tell me about... I looked that up, like, two weeks ago, but I, I think you told me about it. I think you must have brought it up. Because I remember I just read about that very recently. Yeah, he brought it up in the Discord. I posted it. Yeah. Yes, okay. Yeah, it is much more fitting. You know, this is a... It's a it's an flexible area, this place. Like, we're still kind of figuring ourselves out. Maybe we need to do more speed and figure it out. <laughs> I think we need a little less eye contact. Like, I'm looking at my screen, and there's nothing even written on it. <laughs> Just to avoid looking you in the eye. I did, I did warn you ahead of time, because you asked. And Well, I didn't know it would be like this. Well, you can't know exactly how like, it's going to be. I keep leaning back instinctively. <laughs> we're humans, right? We're humans. We, we go and we talk about abstract ideas, right? But we forget that we're humans. Yeah, yeah. And That's the point of theory. That's why I do it. Right, because we're humans. To avoid situations like this. Right, but, like, we're trying to get you outside your comfort zone a little bit. Okay, by, well... You got me there. Well, we're, we're trying to get everyone outside their comfort zone. <laughs> I do podcasts every week, but it's very comfortably on Zoom. Yeah. Well, but that's the problem, right? It's like it's all just looking at your screen some more. I don't think that's the problem. That's the problem. That's like that's the, the joy that mm. modern technology brings. Yeah, you get to like be uh, distant from people, other yeah. human beings. Yeah. Do you not, find it e close. easier to just speak fluidly when it's uh, on the screens? Like you feel like you can collect your thoughts more? Not necessarily, but... You know, like COVID, COVID in this way was a blessing because everything moved onto the screen. Class mm. now on screen. So that was a that was a blessing. Yeah, I think that was a huge curse. I vote, I vote curse, but I want to know why you think it's a blessing. Just because of I again situations like this. <laughs> <laughs> like what exactly? Like this is comfortable, right? This is like we're we're using the space. Mm -hmm. So this is what a f three and a half foot gap or so. Yeah. This. The one foot gap, <laughs> when you have other space to be, it's kind of like when someone's pissing in the urinal and, yeah, and there's they free right ones to you, yeah. and they go right next to you. Yeah. Right? That's, that's how this feels. You kind of ten, tense up. The stream stops, like this, you know? Right. And here's like the stream of consciousness. This happened to me actually on the stair, I was on the Stairmaster. Mm -hmm. How all good stories start. I was on the Stairmaster and there's four in a row and the guy comes and goes to the one next to me. Mm. And I was puzzling in my mind, doing my steps, trying to figure out why he did this. I don't know. Maybe he just liked you. He wanted like a bit of competition. I wondered, I wondered if he was like trying to look at like a, a chick's ass because mm. the, the, the treadmills are in front of the Stairmasters. But I mean, they weren't like, they weren't... They were lower than, than 7 out of 10 asses. So I, mm. I think that would be a weird reason to go next to a dude on the Stairmaster. Maybe maybe he's like a high mid kind of guy. High mid kind of guy. Rogan's a high mid kind of guy. High mid. They're the best people. Shoot your shot. The best, the best all, 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 all the best humans are high mid. There's something attractive about knowing that you might have a chance with them. High mid? Yeah. I think high, high mids are just smarter. Mm. I think they just have like they just they're missing that like kind of inherent privilege, so they have to like they have to have something to offer. So usually it's so like it's more reciprocal. Yeah. Okay. 
And they have like humor, intellect, you know, they always have like an extra layer to their personality. Where you I find like a lot of attractive people just kind of yeah. miss that you, you said second yet, layer. You said yesterday that if someone's hot, they're either like a sociopath or they're dumb. Yeah. yeah. Not all the time, but I think it's like, I find that more often. I see that. Are you a sociopath or are you dumb? Oh, you think I'm hot. <laughs> okay, I'm warming, <laughs> warming up to this now. I can, only, I can only do this because it makes me uncomfortable as well. So there's like a, there's like, I know where the line is. If you, if you just have like, if you're completely socially stupid, then you try to do this and you don't know where the line is and you can't actually respectfully make people that right amount of uncomfortable. So you're using me as like a stim. Yeah. Kind of. <laughs> Rogan was very uh, adamant that we start off with a serious, you know, meaty topic. So go ahead. Uh, what, what is one concept you think in critical theory? that if more people understood, the world would be a better place? Or just like, pe we would, it would be more conducive to change. What is the pill that, they, that the average person needs to swallow? Or should swallow? I'm gonna go with one. I'm not, I'm, I can't say off the top of my head that it's the most important one. But the one that I wanna go with is that Movements are over and history in that sense. I don't mean that history like nothing will ever happen over I mean nothing will ever happen again But the things that will happen are just simulations. So nothing new will happen Okay, hmm. which is uh Again, I said this isn't the most important one perhaps, but it's the one that's been on my mind lately I think uh, Baudrillard is the best articulator of it late Baudrillard and I think if people got that, they would have more fun with not trying to change things or not saying the world needs to be different. I'm going to make it different a certain way. I think it would bring some ease, a little bit of ease. So like, okay. I, I kind of, I remember I was part of a climate protest, uh, like the first Greta Thunberg one, I was still in university and the whole thing all very like LARPing. Is that sort of what you mean? Like it's like pretending to be a real movement. It's Isn't like, that it's, like recent? That wasn't the G, the G twenty one, right? It's like twenty nineteen. I don't know. G twenty was like two thousand ten when a whole bunch of people got arrested. Um, LARPing. I would say yes, it's LARPing, but even the term LARPing kind of assumes that there's a distinction between actually doing a real protest as opposed to a fake protest. Hmm. But if we take this end of history thesis, not to be confused with the other end of history thesis, but Baudrillard's, it's that every protest is a LARP. So every protest is the same, which kind of gives you more reason to do it. Because if you thought that the only reason to do a protest was to change something, then there would be no point because they never really do. Hmm. So instead of you look at it like this is fun, or this yeah, is like, or this like, is exciting. It's aesthetic. It's yeah, like a, a happening. Okay. An artistic happening. So where do you where do you draw that shift when when that history ends? Like the, the protests become you know, performative. That's a great question, um, and I'm trying to figure that out like currently, because um, he can or Baudrillard draws a, a few distinctions. Like he can say art ended with Warhol. So Warhol should be celebrated for that. But as soon as the distinction between art and not art disappears, which is just like product packaging, when he takes products and says, here now this is art, then art dies too. Hmm. Um, I've said elsewhere, like Trump shows that for politics because Trump shows that the whole thing was already a show. It used to be something that we had to take seriously. And you could say, I don't know, maybe when, when actors started becoming politicians, maybe that's when it shifted. But when a reality star becomes president, then you know, like politics has ended that way. But protests, I don't know. Like which one do you, which one do you draw attention to? Um, the Vietnam protests seem to be ones that people still believe in even now and like, they look back and nostalgize them. Um, so I, I'm not sure. But yeah. The 
the idea between the annihilation of history thesis is that everything's already ended and we're just going to drift towards realizing the end and it'll slowly peter out. So I can't, I don't know if you can draw a line with protest. Would you draw a line with protest? You said you felt in 2019, like it had already ended. Yeah, that definitely felt like a game. I remember being at this, it was in, it was in Halifax, Nova Scotia. And there was like 10,000, 20,000 people. We marched through downtown. We had a police escort. Um, it just felt like fun. Like, this is a fun way to spend an afternoon. There was nothing like, and we, everything was like scheduled. Like, okay, now everyone's going to lie down for 15 minutes. And now we're all going to get back up and keep walking. Like, it just felt so like a fucking daycare. It's <laughs> super weird. But I, then I, when I think about the 60s, like, I think about like, we really romanticized that. Or even like, I'm trying to think like the, like the Black Panther movement. Like those sort of protests, they feel, that feels really genuine. But I can't think of like anything recently. Well, and then currently I, there's like, 500,000 people in DC, right? Yeah. So real, not real. I think it's funny, like one way to show the death of a protest is that you have to like file with the police in yeah. advance. So any of this spontaneity that is supposed to cause disruption uh, has disappeared with that. It has to, even the protest, which is supposed to be this spontaneous outburst, you know, ideally. It's like bureaucratized mm. and then you submit it to the cops in advance. So what about like Occupy Wall Street? That's a good point. I think that might have been the last protest. Yeah, because that's when everyone. That was the realization that this is nothing and they tried really hard. Mm. Hmm. Can I pick that apart? Yeah. Um, so you say history ended in 2019. You say history ended with Occupy Wall Street. Well, just the history of protest events. Yeah, I don't. I, I don't think 2019. I'm just. I'm just reflecting on. That's the last like big protest I was at. Because there's not one. There's not one grand arc of history. Mm. There's like little. It, it's what you call an event mm. would be the question. This reminds me of. Um, there's video essays. They say the day the SpongeBob died, and it was when they stopped being five. There's also video essays. The day the Simpsons died, and it's when they stopped being the target demographic for the Simpsons. Are we, are you, are, are you maybe just, are we, are we just old and white? You have to be white to watch SpongeBob. Is this the opinion of a disaffected whitey? I never really watched SpongeBob. <laughs> <laughs> or am I getting too focused on SpongeBob? Yeah, you're too focused on SpongeBob. The 500,000 people in DC, is that real? Th that's my question. I think yeah. we'd have to see after the fact. Okay. But what's, like, what's, 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 like for, for example, yeah. they go there, they protest. 500,000 people, one of the largest protests the in, ever. The, the insurrection that we're talking about? No. No, no, no. The, I'm the a, protest in Gaza, right? Like, yeah. Currently. Oh, I didn't know about this. Yeah. So 500,000 people, the next day. No, there's not 500,000 people doing an insurrection right now. Okay. No, not I, I thought yet. we were talking about January 6th. Not yet. The next day, there's $20, $20 billion more because Israel's running out of missiles. Right. So this shows a huge disconnect from, you know, the idea of democracy and the effectiveness of protest. So I don't want to call it too early, mm -hmm. but we can call Occupy Wall Street at least. Was January 6th fake or real? Very fake. It was awesome. It was fake and awesome. It was awesome because of how fake it was. Mm -hmm. Tell us about that. It was like the, the, the beer hall pooch, except they went in in costumes to take pictures of themselves. That's like, it's beautiful. Right. If I were, if I were organizing the best happening, just like a 60s art term, mm -hmm. the best happening ever was probably that. Like a guy in a cow costume. Yeah taking f selfies of himself in the sacred halls of power. I think that's aesthetically beautiful. But of course I condemn the violence and blah, blah, blah. If there was a huge mass of people and they took over the government and they overthrew the election, would that have been real? But that could never happen anymore. That was, that was never a possibility. No. And the liberal hand wringing about it is just neurotic. Absolutely. It's paranoid critique. But they need something to be upset about, because otherwise you wouldn't vote for them. Mm. Uh, that's where Sam Harris like lost me completely. Is after that, 
I just like he just still talks about the insurrection. He'll st- <laughs> he'll still he'll still do like ten minute kind Wait, of. Wait, that's rants. when Sam Harris lost you. <laughs> yeah, I like I like his meditation stuff a lot. Oh, you hung on for a long time. Yeah, I hung on. Uh, the meditation stuff and the he's twenty five. He's great. Oh, he's a twenty. Okay. Okay. Yeah, I wasn't I wasn't conscious when he was when he lost other people. I guess. He lost me the first time I heard him. <laughs> the first like, word he spoke. Islam is a religion of fanatics. <laughs> Islam is a religion of yeah, he fanatics. Was called, I guess you don't know this. He was, he was called like the four horsemen. Before there was Jordan Peterson, there was the four horsemen. Yeah, the, the, the new atheist. Yeah. Yeah. And that was like the big debate. But that didn't, interestingly... Thinking about it, that really didn't have this kind of left-right binary that we kind of apply to every situation now. Mm. So Dawkins, Hitchens, Dennett, and Harris. Yeah, but they were they were kind of what became the same mindset of right-wing twenty-year-olds. Mm. But it wasn't. I don't remember at the time. How do you remember this? Were you conscious? No. Have you heard of the, the new atheism? anti SJW pipeline. Yeah. 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 So I was on the other side of all those guys because I read a book by a Marxist literary critic called, named Terry Eagleton. And he wrote a whole book against it. And this was probably the first, you know, leftist book that I read because it was by a Marxist. So this is why I say I was opposed to Sam Harris from the beginning because this guy just made so much sense. Are you a postmodern neo-Marxist? Absolutely. <laughs> what else could I be? So you identify as a postmodernist? No, not a postmodernist. A postmodern neo-Marxist. neo-Marxist. Specifically. You need, you, need the, you need the whole thing together. <laughs> Otherwise, it doesn't mean anything. Mm. But together, it has power. Yeah. I love that phrase so much. Yeah. It's beautiful. I'm bent on the destruction of civilization. Western civilization, capital W. And, uh, yeah. That's it, just. So are these guys. Just that. Did you set these up on purpose, these specific ones? We just for you. We, uh, they were up a while ago. They no, were, they're, they're just, just for you. <laughs> we picked them out just for you. We swapped them around. We've also got the fountainhead. <laughs> <laughs> uh, there's some decent, some decent literature here. Some of, it, some of it I've gotten, some of it I haven't. I feel like a lot of theory, of, I'm pretty like, I'm not like anti-critical theory, but a lot of it just evades me. Like I can't. How so? I just, I feel like so much of it is just the over, uh, over intellectualizing of like basic concepts. And it, it's, it's just like endlessly reductive and it never gets to a point or a conclusion or gives you a solution to just like, this is this and this is this. And it just deconstructs. I find I don't really, I lost interest in it really fast. Where would you draw this, the distinction between like analyzing what you're, or overanalyzing? When does it become over? I think when it's when you're getting books and thinkers that you need like seven years of prior knowledge to understand fully, and then they don't end up saying anything either. They just continue to to deconstruct. He's reading the Burnout Society, and he doesn't like the uh, that he, they reference other academics <laughs> instead of positing wildly. Just <laughs> like positing. Because we're used to I love watching YouTube posits. videos. Instead, of, we're not academics. We just watch YouTube videos. And YouTube videos, they just posit wildly. They're like, "This is this, and this is this, and this is this," and we're uh, credulous, and we say, "So true." Well, I mean, it's I, funny that you say that because <laughs> Byung Chul Han is known for positing wildly. Yeah, he's the most. He he's the most enough. wildest positor. Of oh, writers. I love a wild positor. He's a wild positor. But you don't like the references. Yeah, I think I think just like referencing, especially when it's getting into like this author and the, this, I don't know, uses, uses a word like otherness or something like that. But then it's like that author specific definition of otherness where it's like, if you say like Foucault's, I don't know if this is a real thing, but like Foucault's otherness. And that doesn't mean otherness. That means specifically Foucault's otherness that you need context to understand in, in the terms of Foucault and then use that in a sentence and use that to explain another idea where it's, it's so self-referential and so like lore heavy. It just seems like it's, oh, yeah. it seems like Philosophy it's, not, lore. it's not doing anything for the world at that point. I don't, I don't know how it, like it's beneficial to even like create works like that at that point. That's because you haven't done enough sunk cost fallacy into 
learning all those terms though. Well, that's the other thing too, is I feel like there's a lot of, yeah, a lot of sunk cost, a lot of like, oh, I have to use this knowledge because I have it. So I have to use this knowledge whenever I can. You keep making references to like doing something for the world. What would be a book that does something for the world as opposed to like a theory book? Something that's accessible that even if the conclude, like I'm not looking for like a silver bullet, but like something accessible that most people could pick up and read and understand like the thesis and the conclusion, the conclusions like here's this problem, whatever it may be, and here's like a potential solution. I think, I think what he's getting at is you might hear something like uh, <laughs> protests are <laughs> fake and then you might be dissuaded from going to a protest. For example, a Palestinian protest. Now you should go to a protest because it's fake. Yeah. How do you square that circle? Why? If it's fake, I want to. I want to do real things. I want to change the world. I'm an idealistic young man. I want to change the world. I want to go and yell and change oh, the yeah. world. I understand that because I was that young man. Remember when the Canucks lost? The riots. And we trashed the city. Yeah. I felt like a real person <laughs> for a minute. Oh, you were there for that? Yeah, I live. That's where I'm from. Yeah. Oh, that's fun. Well, not Vancouver. That area. I'm from a farm. But yeah, I understand. What he's getting at is, I think, um, he wants actionable. He wants actionable theory. He yeah, wants but I'm, at, I'm kind of asking, like, what, do you think if someone had written an accessible book, then this would be more actionable? And to whom would it be actionable? He's deconstructing. Postmodernism. <laughs> so this is not deconstruct. This is like Socratic dialogue. Uh oh! It's not even deconstructed. That guy was deconstructing too. Socrates, the first postmodernist. <laughs> Socrates was just destroying Western civilization. Yes, exactly. So they killed him. Yeah, I think he. I think he. He was suicide by cop. That's a, that's <laughs> that's an off tangent. But Su suicide. By yeah, he's the first suicide by cop. By smartass. Yeah, he. Uh, he just he he shot himself in the foot. He could have won that trial, and he didn't. Fuck you. I'm just going to kill myself. <laughs> Literally. He just wanted to make his whole philosophy make sense. He's like, I love I didn't want to be here anyway. I love justice so much and justice worked. And then everyone's like, you could have just won the trial. What did he, didn't they, they were, they were going to give him two weeks. They're like, his sentence was going to be two weeks okay. for corrupting the youth. And he was like, no, I want to go. The, yeah, anyway. The was, broader thing where yeah. I think Brogan's getting Famous at last words. Is, um, I think his, his perspective on critical theory is that it's just deconstruction, deconstruction, deconstruction. And then... Is it helpful? And then that's where the post postmodernists come in. And we're, we can talk about that because I know you hate it. Um, but like the, that, that's why the idea of metamodernism or something like that is, is enticing to people. is because they view critical theory and postmodernism as just critique, critique, critique. What are we supposed to do about this? I understand that. So what do we do? I think that's a stupid question. Mm. Okay. What do you mean? What do you do? I guess yeah, we, we. I guess we need context on what we're doing, on what the issue is. You want me to tell you what to do? Yeah, you. <laughs> <laughs> you have you have. Access. How's your relationship with your father, by the way? Mine. Yeah. It was good. He passed away, but it was a good relationship. So now you need me to tell you what to do. Yeah, I don't have one anymore. <laughs> Um, okay, no, let's wait, wait, answer the question. <laughs> you asked, you opened that can of worms. <laughs> he died recently. Hey, you I'm not a psychoanalyst. <laughs> um, okay, wait, let's ask him. Uh, circle back around to the big, the big thing. Okay, mm -hmm. so it's like we, you have academia and, and you have critical theory and you have this kind of like academic system that like self replicates, like it creates people who people go into the system and they understand all this jargon, they understand all, this, all, the, all these authors and all these ideas and they get all this knowledge and they go and then they just replicate like what they've learned and then they add like a little bit at the end. And the work is really inaccessible and I just wanted like, what's the point of all that? What's the, what's the point of like reading? Why, why do I need to read like Derrida and Foucault and Gilles Deleuze and Guattari and like any Baudrillard, like all these people, why do I need to understand it? What like could, could I gain what they teach from somewhere else in like a more accessible fa uh, more accessibly? No. No. Can I answer your question with a question? Yeah. How yeah. is that? You you let you're an artist. You got some art hanging. Is this yours? Yeah. How is that different from art? You're like, what's the point? I go to art school. I learn how to paint. 
I copy other paintings. Then I develop my own style. And then at the end of it, nothing ever changes. Why did you do all that art? I dropped out of my graduate degree, actually, at, for art school, because I had that same issue. And yet, and yet this is here. Do you still make art? I think that I, li I just like doing it. I think that's the conclusion I've come to. Well, that'll be my theory answer then. Yeah. I just like doing it. You just like doing it? Oh. Um, put that one. I think it's better. <laughs> that's sort of, that, that book's sort of like art. It's like thought art. It's like, how, how, how much can you f fuck up Engl how, what the <laughs> language? I, I a, how far can you rip the psyche apart? I, have a, I was reading that and my friend picked it up and he's like a mathematician. He read a few lines and he got like mad in like 30 seconds. Like he got like genuinely angry. The laser. I can understand that. The laser physicist? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So he's not, so he's an engineer. Basically. He's very like engineers, logically minded. Engineers are the most like linearly minded people. Yeah. So they would hate this book. But if you're into like pure math, you can tell that's my book is all fucked up. I suppose the Brogan's books, which are like pristine. Because he doesn't open them. <laughs> <laughs> pure math is very non-linear. And I shouldn't say anything more about that because I don't understand it. But a, a math guy explains it. Deeply philosophical, yeah. I guess. Well, it's more like throwing shit at the wall and seeing if it works. Mm. Math. Engineering is the most linear. To me, the, the Deleuze and Guattari stuff is like playing the wrong notes. And then it's like, where does this go? Hmm. Because I like dissonant music. Because like dissonant music is like, you're not supposed to do that. But you can like go in that direction. And then you're like kind of going in like a direction no one's gone in. Yeah. I don't find it really dissonant, though. Mm -hmm. Like every, every section has a point mm -hmm. and a target and what they think is an improvement. Maybe not for the world, but for like even even pushing language because we use language all the time. No one ever asks what it is. It's like one of the things that I've liked most about theory. We talk constantly and never ask what it is that we really are doing when we're talking. And just a basic question, like, does language speak us or do we speak language? Despite the fact we didn't create any language, none of the words we're using here are our own. We're just adopting them or pulling it from somewhere. But even a question like that about something that we do so often, I find those kind of questions interesting. So I don't do it so that I can change the world because that would be very silly. Huh. But I think a lot of people that are drawn to theory and maybe this abstract sort of theory that takes a lot of buy-in, probably what they're interested in is looking at the familiar in an unfamiliar way. Mm -hmm. I think that's a drive and maybe a pathology. And maybe that's, yeah, the pathology of the theorist. You want a nicotine pouch? No, I'll just vape. You stick this under your tongue? I'm, I'm on, on your lip. Pretty, they're pretty great. I'll take a fresh one. I got a fresh page in me. You guys ever done like chew? Yeah, I love yeah. chew. You run snuff, like the snorting tobacco? I've that, never snorted tobacco. Though. That stuff's great. The, uh, the British guard, they banned smoking in Buckingham Palace in like the late 1800s and the guards cr created snortable tobacco. It's like just, it's like the texture of cocaine, but it's tobacco. And it comes in a little tin with a thing on the end, like a coke nail and you like, and you just do a little puff and it's just like an instant like head rush for like two minutes, it's so good. It's probably the most cancerous thing on the planet. That's not the way I would want to take nicotine. Yeah, it kind of, it kind of defeats the point of what nicotine, nicotine's benefit, but. Uh, it's a cool concept. Okay, do you think like... Can I have a hit? No. <laughs> I'm not... That's like kissing you. <laughs> <laughs> we, we can touch knees. <laughs> Look, I'm war I've had half a beer. I'm warming up to it. I can touch knees with you. <laughs> but sharing a vape, it's too far. You know, we, you were the most... We, we were the most excited to have you on the podcast of all of our guests so far. I appreciate that. I don't feel like it's uh, going well. You don't think so? No, like my, I feel like tense in my shoulder <laughs> still. That means it's going well. No, if I, if I, 
had if I wasn't weren't driving and I could have two beers, then maybe I'd be like cuddling up a little bit. <laughs> Continue your question. Okay, so maybe a good analogy, maybe just for, for me to understand theory. Well, it, let me let me first give you some ground here. Okay. A lot of theorists or theory types or lovers of theory, they do think they're changing the world. I just find them annoying and so do you. Yeah. So that that established. I think the psychological background, you know, for Brogan in particular is he like really just deconstructs his thoughts and he's like, fuck, why am I deconstructing my thoughts? I have to do something. <laughs> so this is that's where this is, this is coming from. All these questions are coming from that emotional core. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Well, when you ask the Eric question, I know, I know what you mean, because it's like you can just start asking questions about anything and then eventually get to like a kind of shoulder shrug. Like, oh, I don't know why. I don't think like you really there's no like logical God given answer on why anyone does anything. Well, you do it because you like it. Yeah. Ultimately. Yeah. Which is a, as good as answer as any. You know, you agree. Well, with there's, the... there's liking things and then believing in things. Believing in things, I think, is really suspicious for most people, most of the time. But when you do believe in something, that's important. Hmm. But liking takes up the rest of the space. And then, what? We like making content, drinking a beer, putting nicotine under our tongues. Yeah, whatever. Yeah. That's most of our time anyway. So, well, I was gonna make, the, the analogy I was gonna make is maybe like, um, you know, imagine like an imaginary product that changes the world or like makes the world a better place. And then behind that product, there's like 200 engineers. And then if you try to understand, like if someone just with no concept of what the engineers do comes into one of those engineers and tries to understand all their work and then tries to like get something out of it, they're not going to really find anything, but it's the combination of what everyone does that produces like one good product. Is theory sort of like that, where it's like, there's all this dialogue, all this conversation, all this work behind like one good idea. And then that good idea becomes mainstream. Ooh. I guess I, I guess I'd need to ask you what the product is. Like, what do you think is the? If there's anything useful that's come out of critical theory, which is an ambiguous term to start with, but if we're saying French, German, influenced by psychoanalysis and Marx, out of that body, do you think anything has become a useful product? I don't know. I. I'm going to turn that back on you. Is there something that's in, is there something that like people kind of understand now that most people, like if I explain a concept to them, they'd be like, Oh, I know. I understand that concept or that, or it's made its way into politics or it's made, it's made, it's made, it's made its way into the mainstream, but it starts with critical theory or it starts, it starts there. Well, a lot of them have, um, like the concept of oppression or the concept of the other you brought up earlier. Yeah. And you can say these things, and then I'm sure a lot of people are going to cringe because they hate, oh, yeah, you're talking about the oppressed again. But imagine if no one had ever brought up the concept that the oppressed are the opposite of the privilege. Yeah. I think that would be probably worse. Yeah. Um... And also, if you only had, if you had no like countervailing force, the only force you'd have in the 20th century, and I'm talking about like leftism, Marxism, most of these guys at least started out as Marxists. These guys, these guys still is. Got to get a Nick Land book as well. <laughs> you have, you have most to most, most all of them were inspired to some degree by Marx. And then to one degree or another ran into the world Mm. and saw this doesn't work for one reason or another. But the reason that this doesn't work is because all of ideology, all of what you'd call propaganda, all the way down to advertising is uh, the American empire, which for material reasons became the liquidating force of not only economics, but also ideas for basically a century. What do you mean liquidating force? Like it's, it had all the money, it had all the interest in control, because it was the Cold War, right? So I think we kind of underrate, we think the Cold War is like two states, but so much of what happens internally even 
in America is due to a fear or a hatred or a pathology against communism. Um, and if you're saying what, what's critical theory good for, I think they were all thinking, look, I see this, there's one system and we still have that system, though it's not as, as brazen maybe as it once was, but, um, they, they were all seeing that system and being like, I look in my history books, I look in my philosophy books, I look in the history of literature and they hope for something better than what we have now. So if this is all that we have now, then that really sucks. So if you're just imagining a world without critical theory, then it's all the, all of those aspects of capitalism as an economic system, and then also capitalist ideology, and that's it. Yeah, that's the entire landscape. That seems uh, pretty dark to me personally. Yeah. If no one had ever been like, "Hey, this kind of sucks," and this kind of sucks, and this kind of sucks. Did you run into reality in Occupy Wall Street? I don't think. So. I don't know. I don't think so. Mm -hmm. When did the Occupy Wall Street's really interesting yeah. as an aesthetic thing? Like they coined the "We are the ninety nine percent" thing, yeah, which made no difference ultimately. Mm -hmm. I heard with Occupy was um, they started trying to do like in the weeks into the protest, they started trying to do like direct democracy amongst the protesters, and that's when everyone could have disbanded. Like the majority of the people that were really set on it left. Honestly, I think the reason that a, a bunch of people left was because it started getting really cold. <laughs> like, <Yeah. laughs> That's it, it was like November in New York. Yeah. But no, you watch those. Yeah, you watch those back and it's super cringe because <laughs> it's like everyone is repeat. They, everyone repeats the words that the speaker says so that the people in the back can hear and everyone gets a chance to have the mic. And then you just have like wackos, <laughs> whack jobs taking the mic. I think but, yeah. that... To, to, to expand your like protests as like protests aren't protests anymore and we should accept that and like accepting that will make them better we should also accept they're also cringe there's a there's a there's a, there's a cringe element to protests or just any sort of authenticity mm. there's a, it's there's a little cringe to it i think that's important to accept do you think the art is cringe i think i think more art is cringe than not cringe wow yeah. Or art as a whole is more cringe than it's not cringe. Yeah. Not in a bad, like, doesn't, it doesn't ruin it. It's not, not in a bad way. I just think it is, like... Is, little, this, is this cringe? It's a little, little cringe. There's, like, <laughs> there's, some, there's some cringe in there. I could, like, I could get really uh, sentimental about it if I talk about it. Well, I like, uh, I like that you showed your brush strokes. You know? the, these, are, these are pieces of the Berlin Wall. Because my hometown just had five pieces of the Berlin Wall on display in downtown for like 20 years. And then we put them in an alleyway hmm. to hide them. And there's, just, there's concrete slabs. Or no, they're in the woods on a trail, like a public trail. But they're off the, they're in the woods. So you walk into the woods and there's just concrete slabs of the Berlin Wall in the woods in rural Nova Scotia. Are you post-cringe or pre-cringe? I'm kind of just, I wasn't on the internet like at, in this way until like 2019. So... I'm still even getting used to the, the cringe terminology. Mm -hmm. You're pre-cringe. Oh, you mean like coming to consciousness before that was even a term? Yeah. yeah. I'm, I'm scared to even bring this up in front of you because I know that you are probably one of the foremost authorities on what's cringe. <laughs> I'm, like, I'm an expert. <laughs> <laughs> um, you said that there was no way to get the ideas of like Foucault or Baudrillard without reading them, but well, and, <laughs> not even just reading them. You have to read and reading all the, but, Kant. but your videos on them are very, uh, superficial, clear, clear. And they, they get to, I think the most important points of them are, are all your videos also fake and meaningless and superficial. I think, well, Cause I, I don't find, I don't find them superficial I, or meaningless. I find them like a great resource. I didn't make any videos about Foucault. Baudrillard. Baudrillard. Um, well, I, I'm glad that you don't find them superficial. I mean, they are superficial relative to, like, pulling through the whole book. But 
But yeah. I think there's like there's people that don't know if they like theory. Mm-hmm. Kind of interested, don't know if they like it, and there's no way to be like, hmm, I don't know if I like this. So I guess the product then is an oversimplified version of something that's really complicated, takes a long time to explain, has a whole bunch of stupid terms, some of which are maybe necessary, some of which are not so much. And then, yeah, turning it into a video is, hey, you might be interested in this. You might be interested in this view from a position that at least hopes it's outside of hegemony, the the big view, the capitalist America empire view. Hmm. I think that's great. What is schizophrenia? It's a psychiatric disorder Mm -hmm. as of now. It used to mean a whole bunch of different things. Now it's, I think, they've they've bureaucratized it in the, what's the mental health manual thing? DSM-5. Yeah, they said- It's canon. They said this is what schizophrenia is. These are symptoms that describe it. But it used to be a lot more broad. Like in, oh, not this one, the one before this. Oh, it's on here. Yeah, the subtitle. Schizophrenia meant a whole bunch of different things, including autism. That's interesting. I didn't know that. And autism was first coined, I think, in like the 1920s, but it was, it, it's short for autoeroticism. Is it actually? I didn't know that. Yeah, which is like stimming. Hmm. <laughs> That's so cool. I didn't know that either. It's so cool. Why do you why do you want to know? I'm not an expert on schizophrenia. But but what do you want to know about it? Schizophrenia in a philosophical sense. What does that mean? Um, the only people I know who talked about it are them. Um, pointing to uh, Lacan also had and Guattari. They can't see that. They can see it, but for the Spotify listeners, pointing to Deleuze oh, and Guattari, a thousand lab toes. Pointing to Deleuze and Guattari. So they look at the case of a schizophrenic Mm -hmm. who wrote a book. So this was a very, very well-educated, intelligent guy, got schizophrenia, locked into an asylum. His name was uh, Schraber. So they look at his writing as compared to the way that other psychoanalysts look at his writing. Mm -hmm. And other psychoanalysts see him saying all this stuff and he's like talking about um, the lesser gods trying to take over the upper gods and, and shit like that. And they go, okay, this guy is like repeating daddy issues. And because of God, you know, anytime you bring up God, it's daddy issues for like a Freudian psychoanalyst. So Deleuze and Guattari just looked at schizophrenia and thought, if we look at the words, if we trace out what the words are actually saying, as opposed to trying to fit it into the Oedipal structure, the the mommy, daddy, and then me structure, we can see that schizophrenia does some really productive shit. It's a productive. Um, and it's important to note that no one's saying that like schizophrenics are creative thinkers or better thinkers or anything like that. They just kind of look at the words written by a schizophrenic and say, this is doing a lot more than just repeating a structure. I'm, I'm saying that for the record, though. That schizophrenics are yeah. more creative people inherently. Yeah, I think, I think creativity and schizophrenia are linked. They thought it was linked, too. They just didn't think that the specific DSM-5 diagnosis of schizophrenia was the same as, you know, creativity. Linked because you make lateral connections? Yeah, I think that's what creativity is. I think autism is going really deep into one thing. Vertical, vertical, vertical. Schizophrenia is pulling laterally, making connections between other things. Which was the first one you said? Autism. Oh, I see. I think autism and schizophrenia are like opposite ends of uh, ways of thinking. Yeah, I think a lot of, by these definitions, okay, these are not DSM-5 definitions. No, but we don't like the DSM-5. Well, <laughs> but a lot, of, a lot of theorists are autistic instead of schizophrenic, mm-hmm. including me. 
I kind of look at a schizof more schizophrenic text and say, I wish I could do that, but I, alas, I'm autistic. I'm that's schizophrenic. That's why I can't make eye contact, like hold it. Greg also has very captivating eyes. <laughs> They're really intense. <laughs> Whenever, whenever, whenever we do this podcast and like I'm, I'm looking at the guest and I look back at you and you're always like, I lock with you immediately and it's like, a, I feel like a zap when I do it. I'm so schizophrenic, I'm autistic. So you're so lateral that you're focused? Yeah, it's horseshoe theory. Oh. And that's the real horseshoe theory. Autismophrenia. I have autismophrenia. <laughs> <laughs> okay. The Luz and Guitari, those were schizos. Well, like Guitari was, and I think Deleuze kind of tried to be for two books, but I think Deleuze is an aut autist also. Oh, interesting. Guitari is actually schizo? Like schizophrenic or? I think they opened that book no, by saying. No, no, no. You mean like DSM-5 schizo? No, no okay, just, just schizo. No, he's, a, like a, he's a schizo writer. Schizo writer. Like if you read, this is interesting. If you read Deleuze's work without Guitari, it's like, extremely focused he usually writes just one book on one author if you read De or guitari's work without deleuze it's basically incomprehensible okay like i i don't get anything out of it i know and few people do i know a few people that are like no guitari on his own is the best chaosmosis that kind of stuff but no if you want to read something truly incomprehensible and this frustrates you open guitari's Solo work. So they were they worked well together because one was autismifying yeah. the other. There's your horseshoe theory. Because Deleuze said something directly to that effect. He was like, I didn't know guitar I needed Guitari until we started working together. And then I realized what philosophy could be besides what I was doing before. Mm -hmm. That's beautiful. He said he said the the direct I can't directly cite it from memory, but it's something like um he saved me when I didn't even know I need, needed saving. Hmm. So I feel can, broken. <laughs> <laughs> but you can see a big shift in his own personal style, too, after he started working with Guitari. I, I, I think a focus for schizos is important because they, left to their own devices, will keep getting further and further from reality. Is schizo a concept that you've developed over... Because you're like looking at the camera, so I th assume they know what a schizo is in your terms. It's not my terms. Well, have you been developing it through other content? I think I have an autistic idea of what schizophrenia is in my head. Okay. So, so, so schizo here, we just say schizo as someone who makes lateral connections and doesn't think vertically into one subject. And someone who is better at making lateral connections. Pretty much. As like a big broad stroke. Schizo. Is that all that schizo is? No. Okay. It's also, good enough for the convo. It's also people who have DSM-5 schizophrenia, but that's not a real thing. Schizophrenia is like a million different things. You can get like auditory hallucinations, you can get visual hallucinations, you can get delusions, you can get any three of those things in combination. Yeah, what are you well, have you read any of their stuff? No. Oh. Because I don't know anything about schizophrenia. But it sounds quite... But I've watched, I watch a lot of YouTube videos about them. Oh, I Because I'm schizophrenic. <laughs> <laughs> I can't go too deep into something. You watch a YouTube video and you're like, oh, I get it. That's why I like you so much. <laughs> <laughs> so you can go deep into me. No, we're not there yet. That was only 5% beer, I'm sorry. <laughs> well, what, they, what, what the dudes here, what the boys say about schizophrenia is, I don't know if they'd call it lateral, but at least there's no division between like the inside of the body and the outside of the body and uh, the mind and history. And then they say schizophrenia or schizophrenics tend to be like racist because they just define their own body in terms of the great races or something. I don't know what they're talking about. That maybe, tracks. maybe that's just Dredd Schraber himself, but Lacan had a theory of psychosis, which was like, you're mixing the uh, symbolic world with the real. 
Psychosis is when... One dime told me that. I'm just parroting what other people tell me. Well, I... I mean, I wish I could look it up. But I think psychosis is when you no longer connect um, the symbolic order to to your experience. Hmm. My, my understanding was like, you have, this map, you have this map of the world in your head. And then we have like these stories that orient us through the map of reality. But we don't actually take the stories literally. But someone like, I think Jordan Peterson is probably schizotypal. And he like confuses the two a lot. Like the, the map of the world becomes the actual world. And he's looking at like a DNA helix and he's like, these are, this is literally snakes, you know? Yeah. Well, I'm pretty sure that Lacanian psychosis is when you no longer, you're like your, your symbolic order is like floating on its own. But I'll look it up. Or like when the pineal gland looks like a Fibonacci sequence. Has, it has like the, the spiral. I think, I think the more skits- Well, the, the point is that you, like, you need reference to the outside. So the psychotic loses the outside reference. Because mm-hmm. there's no one, like, sorry, there's no one looking over the system. Mm-hmm. It's like just no, no ego, like just free, well, free you, thoughts. You can't use the term ego, but like you structure your own system in your mind as though someone else were looking at it for you. Mm. And that other person occupies, that, again, other person occupies a position for you. It's why you don't break rules even when you're by yourself. Hmm. But when you lose that, then the symbolic order no longer has references that are maintained between it. At least for the, the psychotic, but I might be talking about my ass. Don't look it up. That would be autistic. <laughs> what We're keeping this good Well, I want to get this right. <laughs> no, 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 no. Don't, don't want to get it right. You ever, you ever get in those conversations, you just feel like you're coming up on mushrooms a little bit? Like you kind of feel like you're buzzing? I feel extremely tethered to reality. That's good. <laughs> you feel like you're buzzing from a conversation? Yeah, I get that. I, I, I get kind of like... That's awesome. Like, uh, <laughs> I have so much cross-reference to psychedelic use, so I'll get in conversation, then I'll just like... I can feel like I'm like losing myself as I talk. I want to know why... I want to know why metamodernism is bad. Oh, metamodernism is awful. What is it? I, I don't know what it is. Metamodernism is meant to trick... I'm a hyper-post-meta-modernist, by the way. Just okay, hyper-post... As long as you have more <laughs> at the beginning. <laughs> metamodernism is for people that think theory can save the world, and they're very serious about this. So, what's an example? Well, they think... Metamodernists want to be meta because they say postmodernism has failed, but modernism had some good things to say too. So we should combine them and we can have the perfect theory. Like deconstruct just enough? You sounded like you just said a great idea, but said in a silly voice. (laughs) Well, then you know it's silly. (laughs) Look, my Lacan website, the good one is suspended. So maybe this is a sign. It's a sign that God doesn't want you to look up. It's a sign that we God doesn't want you to reference that specific academic. I know God wants look, you to pause it wildly right now. I know he for talks, the YouTube audience. I know that Lacan talks about a case, and I think it might be Freud's case of Amy, but it has something to do with the structure no longer functioning. I just can't remember the relationship. Anyway, what are we on to now? Metamodernism. If this was an autistic please, podcast, please do me a favor. I'm breaking the fourth wall. <laughs> Metamodernism is stupid, no matter how much they want you to think it's smart. It's very cringe. Mm-hmm. It's definitionally cringe. I think you you retreated. <laughs> well, well, I, I I like I like I like hyper post metamodernism, and I like cringe. So I, I feel like there's a there's a bit of a wall. Okay, I, need, I just need like one tangible example of metamodernism. You would probably say that. No, they're like, they have, there's like th- three plus movements now that all like call themselves it, but all of them just say postmodernism has failed because all it does is deconstruct everything. Mm-hmm. So we need to reconstruct theory so we can believe in 
good things. Like, they're big into spiritualism too. Okay. They want to like reconstruct. Demystify. They want to reconstruct spiritualism because postmodernism made them feel bad. So, like, is Jordan Peterson a metamodernist without saying he is? They have the same audience. Okay. I think Jordan Peterson's like a conservative. I think he's an anti postmodernist, personally. Yeah. I don't think he's a metamodernist. Yeah, metamodernism wants to use postmodernism, but they really don't actually say anything. Here, here, I'll act it out, okay? Yeah. I'm modernism. Uh, I'm going to build a house, and then I'm postmodernism. I'm going to destroy the house. And then I'm out of modernism. I'm going to sort through the rubble and I'm going to build a new structure and we're going to live in this new structure. And then that's appealing to young people right now because, uh, because they're like, oh, I live in a disassembled world of noise. I'm going to start putting these pieces together and make something that works for me. And look, I found love and now I can believe in love again. Yeah, something like that. Okay. They want to restore like certain why, concepts. Why do you hate love? <laughs> <laughs> Next question. <laughs> I think I think it's a I think what, what about post postmodernism? What do you think about that? It's totally different. I don't know what that is. <laughs> it's just another word for metamodernism. They confuse oh. the two a lot. Post postmodernism, geez. I consider myself an expert on postmodernism, and I've never heard post postmodernism used except ironically. <clears throat> so here's an example of metamodernism. Uh, modernism has a framework of a man. Yeah. And it has all these traits associated with it. The modern man, blah blah blah. Postmodernism might deconstruct that frame. I don't know if that's true, but no, I'm doing, like, let me cook, let me cook. Postmodernism <laughs> might, might deconstruct that I'm frame. I'm sitting with my shoulders back so I can be more manly. And be like, be like, actually being a man is bad, and this is bad, and that's bad, and that's bad. And the metamodernist doesn't deny the postmodern critique. They're like, oh yeah, actually toxic masculinity did exist. But we're gonna create a new model of what a good man is by incorporating that critique, but remaking it and still positing some things about what it means to be a man. So he's tough, but he also cries. Oh, yeah, that's nice. I like that guy. <laughs> <laughs> Isn't that nice? That's yeah, a great guy. Ain't that sweet? And so, they want to do this with other stuff too, like religion and truth. So you're like saying it's, it's it's good, but it's also the other good stuff. Okay. Best of both worlds. What 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 is what's so bad about that? That's just postmodernism. But but that's what it is. But it's with more positing. We're gonna have to break down some terms here if we, if we can continue with this. But yeah, sure. Postmodernism with a big smile, <laughs> a big thumbs up. Postmodernism, but it's a jacked guy. Okay, l l let me, let me uh, I think touch on what I think psychologically is going on, why, why there's an appeal for this kind of stuff. It's because postmodernism, like you said, makes them feel sad. They don't like feeling sad. Well, why, they should understand postmodernism then. The vibe makes them feel sad. Oh, the vibe. Okay. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm de-autismifying it here a little right. bit. I can't argue with vibes. That's a struggle for me because I'm autistic. Mm -hmm. Well, I'm all vibe. Okay. <laughs> so I think, I think people don't like the vibe. They, they, they view it as like deconstructive and, and um, they're like, they don't know what to do. They don't know what to do with themselves. Like Brogan. Brogan doesn't know what to do with himself. That's he's, why I, he's painting. He's doing fine. Yeah, but he wants to have like an intellectual explanation for why he's doing what he's doing. I stop. No, I stop looking for that. You're just doing because you like it. Yeah. Seems a little simple. Yeah. Maybe there are some like maybe, but but that's not necessarily true. I mean, you talk about art. The art you don't like is inherently like meaningless and pointless. And you like art that posits something that has something to say. Mm -hmm. When someone buys your art, you want them to be like, I agree with what this guy's message is. This message: never kill yourself. Right. Yeah. That's a message that you genuinely believe in. You're earnest about it. Yeah. I think you care. You've, you've mentioned several times throughout this conversation, change the world, even if you mean it ironically or rhetorically, but you still believe in change. Aim, yeah, aim, aiming up maybe is, uh, is a better way to... Uh, aiming to, to, somewhere. Uh, aiming somewhere. Don't, don't you, where do you find hope in a postmodern framework? There's no such thing as a postmodern framework. Where do you find hope in your studies? What do you find hopeful about the future? Because the, the vibe of all this stuff that we're talking about seems very black-pilled and pessimistic. And that's how people view postmodernism in general. They view it as black-pilled and pessimistic. And I don't know why you'd see it that way. Because uh -huh. it's the only thing that's different. Mm -hmm. And difference is interesting when everything else looks the same. 
Are we, is it so maybe the issue at its core is just like active and passive nihilism? Like there's a, there's someone, there's a person in the room who eats frozen pizzas once a day and doesn't leave the house and has no vitamin D and doesn't exercise. And they're like, oh, nothing means anything. And the world's meaningless. And then there's another person who's just super healthy and like has community, has a fulfilling life. And he says, nothing means anything. And that's, that's beautiful. I can do whatever I want. Yeah, I think, I think vibe wise, we're connecting all of these movements, philosophies, whatever you want to call it. And we're like thinking, how does this manifest in a person? And we are imagining a postmodern person being depressed and lazy. Do I look depressed and lazy? No. Okay. No. So I'm a postmodern person. I occupy this position because they're supposedly everywhere. But I think I'm pretty much there on most grounds. I can, you can call me a postmodernist and not be wrong enough. Although postmodernism isn't really a thing. Hmm. So you think, so why do you think people would find it sad? If you were, you know- Because they don't get it. They don't get the thing that isn't a thing. Okay, so, <laughs> well, they, they assemble a bunch of things together and then listen to Jordan Peterson or metamodernism and go, well, they deconstruct. Deconstruction belongs to one guy, Jacques Derrida, mm. who got it from Martin Heidegger, and that's it. Like, no one else deconstructs. Well, it's a, it's a specific term for a specific method of reading a text. And it's super boring if you don't like reading. So no one needs to worry about deconstruction. This is made up. And Heidegger, Heidegger was a Nazi, so you can't yeah. trust that guy. No. You can't just write him off. Yeah. <laughs> His ideas led him to join as the Nazi as party. I, as soon as I found that out, I threw all my books in the garbage. Actually? No. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I believe it. So you gave two examples. You gave the guy who eats pizza and is depressed yeah. because he just watches porn and XQC all day. Yeah. And, and, and thinks the world is like, he's like, oh, nothing means anything. Nothing means anything. Life's pointless. And then you had the person who has a meaningful life. And the examples that you gave are like community. Did you give any others? Yeah. Community, exercise, success, sunshine. Okay, so neither of these things have anything to do with postmodernism or modernism if those are real things. Because mm -hmm. those things are about like history and a grand history of philosophy and concepts and theory. So both of those people are living outside of concern for that region. Okay. And almost everybody is living outside of concern for that region. Like change, change the world is a slogan that is inherently meaningless. No one does that. No one has done that except like Napoleon. <laughs> so, no one's ever changed the world except Napoleon. Well, you mean change the world like single-handedly, put, put the weight of history on their shoulders and then done something about it. Yeah. Do you, can you make Regardless, you shouldn't be talking about changing the world because no one's ever done it. If Napoleon did it, then he's the only one. And maybe like Genghis Khan. So. Can you make, first of all, loser talk. <laughs> Second of all. Um, does that mean I'm, does that mean I'm not uh, grind core? <laughs> You're not grind core enough. <laughs> 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 we, we're trying to grind hustle here. <laughs> uh, grind hustle, that's it. Russell. Um, I'm too schizophrenic, I lost what I was trying to thought. Okay, so what is postmodernism then? It's, it's not a thing. It's not a thing. It's not a thing. It's a thing I, Jordan Peterson It's made. possible we were brain rotted. <laughs> we, we were, we, I think that this actually is what happened. Like we were brain rotted into thinking postmodernism is like a thing. And, and no it's one actually like understands anti -USSR it. It's like anti-USSR propaganda. Hmm. Okay. Anti-red propaganda. So w what makes it not a thing? Well, I don't know. It's describing an artistic movement. It just describes clearly. We both think it's a thing. Yeah. It's just, why don't but you tell me what it is? We both. Our understanding of it is from our the culture of being on the internet for twenty four seven. Oh. And that's most people's understanding of it. Well, okay. Art. I think it was first architecture. 
architecture, modernism is a clearly defined style as opposed to like art deco, neoclassical, what occurred before. So in there, postmodernism makes sense because it took certain aspects of modernist architecture, you know, angular organization of space and this, and then said, we're doing not that. But then architecture moved on and started doing other neos and other, other resurrections of stuff and similar to art. The problem when you apply it to theory is the guy who coined the term, who's, he was studying in Quebec, actually. He's a French guy, but he's studying, uh, Quebec paid him. So, you know, nothing good comes out of there. <laughs> you, you like JJ, JJ McCullough. <laughs> he also <laughs> agrees with you that, um, that Anyway, I, I wanted to finish this bad. point. Leotard said this was the worst thing he ever published. He wished he had never coined this term because everyone repeats it endlessly. And it shouldn't even be a word. And he's the one who made the word. Mm. But that's not the only use of the word. That's like the cultural use of the word. The way Jordan Peterson uses it is to describe a set of authors that are French. And that's kind of it. And I'm saying the connection between those two is tenuous. But no one reads those authors that are French that are supposedly so bad, including this is considered a, a book of postmodernism. And it's not that bad. This is a very hopeful book, in my view. I think maybe my understanding as just like touching on it in university uh, and the Internet and just my, my my perception of God from it is that you have like pre-modernism is religion modernism is progress as like as meta narratives postmodernism is like the lack of a meta narrative like po like the postmodern era of society like 19 you know 45 onward or 1960 onward wherever you want to like draw that distinction that we're in now that most people believe we're in now from like whether it's superficial or not most people believe it is that we're just like we have no meta narrative like post truth basically i think that's how most people if i say like Oh, the, like postmodern society or like the postmodern era. That's what they imagine, like post-truth, post-meta narrative, post-religion, post-progress, post-science. Yeah, that's what Leotard defined it as. Okay. The death of meta narratives. Okay. And he, he didn't like that. He was like, that's the worst thing ever published. He didn't like that he had published it because he said, he said, I have way better shit. I basically threw this together overnight and then people saw the term and they're like, ooh, a term. I like that. Wait, the new, we have a new era? Is a new a new era dropped? That's that so exciting. New era drop. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> that's, okay. that's how ideas spread now, though, on the internet. With terms. Yeah, you just make a fun. That's term. what the meta modernists are trying to do. They're trying to term drop. Yeah. And then everyone's like, "That sucks, guys." Uh, yeah. Everyone. I think you're fighting a losing battle, to be honest. It's gaining momentum. Yeah. The young people really like it. Oh God. Yeah. Have you heard, have you heard of Redeemed Zoomer? It's a YouTube channel. I think he's like an 18 year old autistic guy who plays Minecraft and he builds like chapels in Minecraft and just talks about like the Protestant Reformation for 13 minutes. He went from like 10,000 subs to 200,000 in a month. 19 years old talking about the Protestant Reformation? Yeah. That's kind of cool. He released a video today. It was the 90 Very lateral. 95 theses against liberalism. I didn't watch it. Time, I just saw the thumbnail. Wait, he has time to play Minecraft and release 95 theses? Yeah. <laughs> This is a very impressive. Redeemed Zoomer. Sounds redeemed. Yeah. And are you in analyzing that as in a meta modern way? Yeah, I think so. I think I think people are so I mean, you see that with um, Andrew Tate and like the obsession with Islam now amongst the red pill communities. It's people being like, oh, we need something. We need something right now. I'm going to go back to religion. A meaning hole. Yeah. It's all in the meaning. Yeah. I don't, I don't think people, I think people just don't understand that it's like re, the world was religious and you found religion because the world was religious. Yeah. And you can't just like, you can't not, you can't be born the first 25 five years of your life having no belief in God and then just pick one when you're 26 and you're sad and then be as religious as someone in the fucking year 1600 was. Young people are, I'd say, going through a crisis of meaning. Or maybe we all are. Okay. Listen, young people. This has nothing to do with postmodernism. <laughs> <laughs> if you're going through, like, and I mean that very seriously, like all of the, dis the, the descriptions, even if you're doing metamodernism, say, say that our culture is postmodern. 
in the sense that it's post-religious. There are tons of reasons for why religion is not convincing. Mm -hmm. Um, Namely that we live in, you know, like multiculturalism is considered a value and tolerance. So the the creation of an in-group structure that is something that religion gives you, like we are this community, we hold to these beliefs. If there's no reason to, to maintain those distinctions because like the state is not religious, then obviously the reasons, the personal incentives to belong to a religion, those are gonna disappear. They didn't disappear because some French authors wrote books yeah, or because fucking Marx wrote a book. Like the decline of, the religi- of religion is completely due to incentive and economic political factors, like the broadest factors you can consider because it happens in a slow trickle. It wasn't like there was a sudden drop off in religion at some point. Yeah. So it's not postmodernism, it's capital. You know, I don't like just saying that everything's capitalism's fault, but <laughs> the way that systems... I didn't say capitalism, I said capital, a much cooler word. Capital. I mean, society is functionally differentiated, right? Mm-hmm. So religion used to play a very central role in every single person's life, like everywhere. And then when modern society becomes functionally differentiated, you have like a, a secular state, you have, you have uh, a secular education system that is funded by the secular state, then it doesn't become the center anymore. So now everyone's like, oh, where, did, where the fuck did religion go? Well, it went into all these dispersed avenues. The one thing that people are apparently missing, I don't, I'm not missing this at all, but they're missing the meaning part of it. And they wanna get that back. But the way to go back is not to go back to religion, because the, the, the functions that religion used to have in a society are nothing like they could be today. Like church attendance is, if not legally mandatory, then like at least socially mandatory because your neighbors would be like, where the fuck you, where you, you weren't in church. Or these, these rituals that would, that would ensure your place in the community by going to church. Those are not gonna, you're not gonna get any of that shit back. Yeah. You're just gonna get a, like a, a band-aid for your your god-shaped hole or whatever the fuck they're calling it these days. <laughs> yeah, no, I, I, I align with that, definitely. I think something that uh, our chat and I are both interested in are is uh, like how people get meaning. And I guess we're just wondering, I'm, I'm wondering, like you say you don't have a problem with the meaning stuff. And why don't you have a problem with the meaning stuff? Can you, like, I, I want to know how the question is being asked. Like, what do you mean? Why haven't you killed yourself yet? Okay. Why haven't I killed myself yet? I wonder if this is a, because I can only answer this personally, obviously. I don't know mm-hmm. how to answer this except from, I, I can't generalize the answer. But why are you expecting so much from the world would be my first question. Because it doesn't seem like throughout history, a lot of people were like, I need to find meaning or I'm going to kill myself. Now, is that because they had it? Or is it because we ask the question differently than they used to? Do you have any thoughts on that? That's a serious question. Yeah, I think, I mean, I, I find as I, as I get older, I find it's uh, easier to parse with. I don't, I think when I was a lot, when I was younger, like my early, when I was like 21, 22, I had a lot of issues with it. And I just stopped, I think I stopped like grasping at things and looking for meaning and purpose in like every single thing I did. And I stopped like hunting it. And I was just like, oh, I just like live life day to day, call my mom talk to my friends on Discord like once a week. So is it an age thing? I think part of it's an age thing. I think just most of the internet's 20. Yeah. Most most of the internet's 20 year old men all talking. Middle class. Death spiral. <laughs> yeah. Death, death drive spiral. <laughs> yeah. Um, middle, yeah, middle class 20 year old men who have the time to talk online for five hours a day and 
all communicate with each other. I think that's part of the issue. Everyone kind of grows up together now on the internet. And a lot of those issues that, there's the issues of like, oh, what's my, you know, not like what is my purpose in life in some like really grand sense, but just in like a normal way that anyone asks that when they're young, like, oh, what I want to do, what I want to be when I grow up, right? And now it's like everyone's asking that, but they're like asking it together to each other. And it just seems like a much more existential problem where like everyone's, everyone's lacking something major, but like they're really not. It's just like, it's a simple, like just live your life, do the things you like, stay healthy, have community. Like, it's not like a big, there's nothing big missing, right? I think you have to like look for it in like maybe less traditional places. It's not handed to you like it was handed to you with, with religion, where it's like, okay, you're born and you have God and you have to, and you have to follow like religious doctrine and you go to church and like all this thing revolves around that. It's not as simple, but it's not like, it's not like it's gone completely. Like the things that make humans happy. Who's that, um, is it like Tolstoy? I forget what author it is, but he says like, it's a talk about like families, like all happy families look the same. All miserable families look dramatically different. I think the things that make us happy are just like, they're simple, obvious things. Like all happy people kind of do the same things. Choosing your job too. Yeah. You just, you just get your dad's job. Now you got to pick one. <laughs> That's a good point. Do you agree with that? With what he said? Yeah. Um, say what you said in like a sentence. <laughs> um, meaning and purpose is harder to find than it used to be like 200 years ago or 100, whatever, whatever time you're looking at, but it's still there and it's not like impossible to find. It's just like, just do the normal things. Just be normal. Yeah. Just do normal things that make most people happy. Yeah. Doesn't have to be avant-garde. Um, I don't know. I wasn't, I wasn't alive 200 years ago, mm. but I, I, th I like the vibe <laughs> of what he said. Well, that's like, I think, I think it's a good vibe. I think we, this would be a description of a postmodern society. We have a hyper aware sense of everything that happened before. Mm -hmm. And it's not actually what happened before. It's just been narrativized. Like even the way we're narrativizing, oh, back in the day, you didn't have to choose your job. You just got to do your religion and you were happy. I mean, that's probably not true yeah. because otherwise, <laughs> otherwise nothing would have changed. Yeah. So we narrativize now in the way that a history textbook narrativizes, said first we had this and then we had this. But I think part of the narrative that we've got still is what I said to you earlier, we can change the world. So the question is not, hey, how are you gonna be happy? It's how are you gonna change the world? Mm -hmm. How are you gonna be like Steve Jobs who changed the world? Mm -hmm. By himself, not with a team of people or anything like that. You know. So if you put, if you start with a burden on a 20 year old moron um, and they're like, how am I going to change the world? Then if that's their question, then no matter what they do, they're going to be unhappy by it. Yeah. And no matter how many 30 year olds tell them, you know, man, just, it's going to be okay. It's going to be okay. Even if you don't change the world, that's not really good enough for a 20 year old. And I know this having been 20, you want to feel like you're protesting Coca-Cola um, killing union leaders in Colombia, you know, you want to feel that. And I guess it's normal to feel that 20 year old. That's what 20 year olds are for socially. <laughs> They're where the energy comes from. Um, but I don't know. I think if you feel like this world is meaningless, maybe the first question is to ask, why do you expect to have so much meaning? Yeah. Play a paint, just do a painting. Yeah, do a painting. Make some stuff. Yeah, that, that is that is a good, that is a good, to flip it back around. Yeah, like why do you expect it to have so much meaning? That's a good point. I like that. Typical. We ask a postmodernist about meaning. He answers our questions with more questions. <laughs> and Socratic dialogue. Socrates was the first postmodernist. I think we've agreed on that. Yeah. <laughs> Typical. Uh, I don't know. I just wish people would. Uh, Wish people would brighten up a little bit. I just want to know, like, I, I, I think in myself, I want to at least, like, things are getting, I don't think the world, the world, people get so sensationalist about it, like, the world's not ending. I don't think, like, the apocalypse is happening. But it's just things are like, getting, like, worse slightly. There's, like, more mental, I don't know, I don't, I don't even want to say there's more mental illness because we just define mental illness differently. So I, I don't even want to say that because that's too much of a, of, a, of a reach. But I think there's, like, tangible evidence that people are less happy 
than they used to be even like 20 years ago or 30 years ago, and especially young people. And then you look at like sexlessness is a big one as well. And people feeling lonely, like really just like tangible qualifiers of what makes someone like a fulfilled person. And though all those numbers are going up and I want to know like at least, or at least I want to understand why that is and then make it 1% better. You know, not radically, not being like, I found the answer, everybody. We have to do this one thing. and It's all going to get better. Can and you, I found it. Can, can you see the, po- the point or make the case for being delusionally uh, optimistic in terms of like thinking you can change the world? Like if you aim for it, you might get somewhere. Should I make the case that it's... Can you, can you see that point of view? That why someone would want that? Yeah. Well, everyone would want that. Uh-huh. But uh, that's a fantasy. So you're, 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 you're basically saying, like, you want it as a human, but you can't get it. And you should just accept that. Well, there, also, I want to know why we want it. Because I don't think this is, like, a historical... The, the, the dude who's building the pyramids, I don't think he's thinking, how am I going to change the world? Or maybe he but thinks he's, that he's but, changing but the world. But he's doing it so opinion. meaningfully. He's like, I'm going to live forever in this awesome mausoleum, in this tomb. It's all so meaningful to me. I don't know. Did the Egyptian poors live forever? Or did well, just not, the... not the poors. They had to do it. But like the guy building the pyramid, like the yeah. emperor. True. <laughs> the pharaoh. Like that was a deeply meaningful act, I'm sure, to him. I think I have an explanation for why. This does not come from postmodernism. It's a different theory. It's okay. a systems theory. Yes. But we're talking about like 200 years ago, 100 years ago. And then like 4,000 years ago, yeah. I just dropped that in for some reason. <laughs> but the, the differentiation of society and the different parts of society that are organized, they're far more complex now than they were 100 years ago, 200 years ago, 4,000 years ago. Like 4,000 years ago, the emperor or the pharaoh is at the same time the head of the religion, the head of the entire political system, the guy who is in charge of the entire economy, mm-hmm. he's like, we're going to dedicate 20 years to making this pyramid for me. Also then, like a literal god, like not yeah, human. Yeah. <laughs> then it happens. So these are very simple systems in that all the decisions are made by one part. Whereas if you transfer into the, the modern state, like uh, between, between the 15th century and now, the modern state has... Different people making decisions for religion, different people making decisions for every single part of the economy, every single part of politics. Um, The people making decisions within politics have a bunch of people below them that don't change with, you know, elections or whoever's allowed to vote or participate in that system. This part's differentiated. Religion is differentiated in the sense that as soon as, like speaking of this Reformation kid, doing Minecraft, as soon as the Catholic Church loses its political position, it also loses its religious position because everyone's like, well, what the fuck do we need you for? The 95 Thesis theses didn't, in my view, have really much to do with the Reformation. That's a symbol of something that had already happened, which is why do we have this church making political decisions? We don't need it. We can have, we can have the, the emperor do that without the sanction of the church. So if you go from a very simple system where one person's making all the decisions, everyone's pretty much happy with that arrangement because no one really wants to make decisions. Yeah. I think that's a part of the reason that this is such a burden. Like we have to fucking do all this for ourselves now, but it gets differentiated, differentiated, differentiated. And then by the time you get to now with, uh, this is a cheap argument, but you know, computers and shit. Um, We don't even make decisions about what, what, people we hang out with it's just whoever's in your chat room at your time who who said the things that you like when you clicked on a button so even relationships are functionally differentiated and that's something different from even 20 years ago so when you have systems and there are people in these systems i don't want to say that's not true but you have people you have systems that basically make the same decision regardless of who's in charge so the freedom aspect that we're designing the world that humans are designing the world that kind of loses its its appeal it loses its ability to convince because whoever's in charge you know democrat republican liberal conservative labor tory it's going to be pretty much the same end Mm -hmm. result so this change the world idea it made a lot more sense when you know marx was writing 
And Marx is like, philosophers have only interpreted the world. The point is to change it. Mm. In that time, though, because systems are simpler, it takes a little bit less effort to change a system. Um, less effort. Yeah, because they're simpler. So you only need, you only need like, how many, how, how many did people did the beer hall pooch? Like 400 people almost took over the government, right? Yeah. Um, but today, because th these systems are all basically automated, even though there's people involved in them, you can't change anything with 400 people. You basically need over half of the entire population to change everything because every system is independent of every other one. So when it comes to this hope to change the world, it's impossible, and it's impossible materially speaking. It's not just a feeling that it is, and it's not just because religion lost its way. It's because everything split because it's more efficient. And it's not even just capitalism's fault. It's just automization as a part of it, too. Wow. There's a theory of everything. He <laughs> posited. He posited. <laughs> Yay! Posit. <laughs> I like that posit. I like that. That felt good. I like that. I think you should posit more. <laughs> We're kind of learning more about Wildly. systems. That On the like, internet. You have a billion views. Well, modernism or postmodernism authors are not the problem. Everything is the problem. Which means that's that another good posit. <laughs> so systems theory. What I, I I've heard I heard you mention that on your podcast. Um, but where can I like learn about like what do I read? Where do I find about it more about systems theory? Because that's something I've like thought about um, superficially before. Or like I think about that a lot, how it's like I this those this whole kind of that's why I don't like conspiracy theorists. Because it's like it's so it's so simple to think there's like five people controlling. It's just, it's mm. like a, a comfy idea. It's as comfy as religion. Right. It's like oh here's the one problem and we fix the one problem. Yeah. There's, there's there's one problem. But it's like there isn't one problem. I think a better question uh, as opposed to what book to read is: Are there any good YouTube videos for our Zoomer audience? <laughs> uh, Do you have one? I didn't make one on systems theory. You're I, the only person that can that can do it. I think. Let me let me tell you: systems theory is so boring. Like, as boring as the name sounds, imagine that boring times 10. Like this, Deleuze and Guattari are very fun because you're wondering, what are they up to in every sentence? Systems theory or general systems theory wants to come up with a generic explanation that you can apply to pretty much any system that you see in the world. And a system is something specific for him. It's something that tries to continue itself into the future. So some systems collapse, most don't, they just keep going and they differentiate themselves. But no, um, the easiest- You made it sound so exciting. I can't imagine it being boring. Oh, it's, it's <laughs> terrifyingly boring. But there's a, an author, the, the author you should look at, his name is Niklas Luhmann. He's a German sociologist and he actually wrote an introduction to his own theory, which is called Introduction to Systems Theory. This doesn't sound like a YouTube video. No, I haven't made one of those yet. Make one. I got another thing coming up. Maybe after. Coming on the pipeline. Do you want to hint at it? I'll just title it like, this is why you can't change anything. So stop being sad Zoomers. That's good. That's really good. That's a million views. Million views. Why have I not talked to you about this before? I could, I could have got so many more clicks before now. <laughs> Million Damn. views. Million views. Yeah. If you just titled it that, easy, boom. And what's the, I'll put a Wojak face on it. Yes! Yeah. Yes! Yeah, the bloomer. You know the bloomer? No, I only know Wojak and the frog. <laughs> the, the bloomer uh, has a hoodie on and there's like sun behind them and he's like smiling looking off of the sky. Yes, yeah, so he's in contrast to the doomer. Who's, uh, he's got like a hoodie on he's like going on a night walk with a cigarette in his mouth. Yeah, active and passive nihilism. This is how we think these days, I guess, huh? Yeah. yeah. You know what? I like the one who's got a giant brain and the brain ah. the brain turns into a chair. <laughs> yeah. yeah. These are our Big brain Wojak. These yeah. are our, our hieroglyphs. You know? Or even like maybe it's like um, you know, in Japanese, like a single symbol means a tree. Stuff like that. This you is know, like this is like another that. one of Bodrad's theses. 
Like I said at the end of history, he didn't actually say it that way. He said, we're going to reach the end of history and then just go backwards and regress to primitivism. So maybe we're on our way. Yeah, I could see. Yeah, it makes sense to me. Hieroglyphics. Hieroglyphics. Yeah, little symbols that just mean, like, this symbol means... You can write a book about this symbol. You can write a master's a thesis, your yeah. dissertation, you, you could write could. that on the Doomer. You could, but you'd be better off making a YouTube video about it. I'm yeah. sure they've been written. Academics yeah. are desperate to be relevant. Yeah. Yeah, definitely. It's going to be like a meme class now. I feel like every university must have a meme class. I know, uh, I know an irony researcher so these memes. An irony researcher? Yeah, New Zealand. What? He did the philosopher's meme. He co he coined post irony and meta irony, which are related to post postmodernism and meta modernism. Irony researcher. Yeah. Does it just? Yeah, yeah. I, I was I was actually I was cited in a ironic I, irony paper, in some university. That's crazy. Yeah. I saw you do a whole video in a garbage can. It's great. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Made me scared to come here, without uh, a program in front of me. Oh, it wasn't so bad, was it? No. Uh, Look, I, you're even tilting your knees away from me now. Yeah, you know, I, tension and relief. It's like you've been socialized. <laughs> yeah, I got socialized throughout the conversation. Mm -hmm. Okay, let's uh, let's 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 go full circle. So systems theory, right? And then like how we started with like academia or our, our critical theory, how it like how it self replicates. Like you learn all these things and you use all these things, and it's like a self replicating system. So is that is critical theory a system? Uh, yeah, I think you, you'd have to you'd have to differentiate it to something a little bit broader. It's um, academia. Yes, I, like the humanities system. It's already dead. Yeah. Like the only it doesn't it doesn't take any, in any energy really because people g just take these humanities courses because they have to. Yeah. There's very few actual humanities majors. And the reason that it can keep continuing is because the government pays the university to pay professors mm. to keep doing these jobs. So it is a system, but it's a limping system that will probably not be around too much. Zombie longer. system? Zombie system. I mean, it survives so long as it's funded from the outside. You can speak of other nation states that exist like that. But. Mm. Okay, so you're gonna you're gonna make the video. Um, the, you can't change the world. Stop being sad about it. Then you're gonna write a book called Zombie Systems, and that's gonna be the new. That's marketable. That's the new thousand plateaus. And then in forty years, um, there's gonna be another group of people like this with zombie systems behind them, and everyone's mm -hmm. gonna keep pointing at zombie systems and referencing it. I mean, like this. Oh, this zombie guy. Zombie systems. This guy. Like, oh, I yeah, think yeah. what this guy was saying. And it'll be because you had a marketable term for it, like zombie system. I would say, though, that descriptively all systems are the same, just some are plugged into the wall, uh -huh. right? Like the funding, mo the funding yeah. apparatus. As soon as you unplug it, it's not going to continue. Other, suppose, other uh, ones can, like, self-replicate. Like, uh, what's a good example? Corporations or something? Like really profitable corporations? Yeah, like the, the electoral system. Mm -hmm. The electoral system is really just every four years or five for us is saying, look at how bad those people are. Look at how bad those people are. Look at how bad those people are. So they're never incentivized to actually do something because all they have to do is wait for their turn to mm. say, look at how bad those people are. Mm. But you don't think we're going to wise up to that and change, change it? No. <laughs> it's too differentiated. Like if a 500,000 person march in Washington, D.C. yields nothing. In, in fact, the, act, the exact opposite than the thing that they were hoping for. I think you've got to think that electoral politics is a system that is not, no longer democratic. Don't vote. I Cry. Agree. I agree. Don't vote. Don't vote, semicolon. Uh, Cry. Because <laughs> <laughs> uh, that, that's a posit. Is it? That, that's a pretty coherent... No, it's vote if you want to. Vote as an artistic activity. Hmm. That's why I do it. That you do private when you push a button. You know when I vote, I, um, I circle the two most extreme parties and I flip a coin. <laughs> I think that's actually how I vote. I don't know if I've really voted. I voted for a communist before mm -hmm. who got like 500 votes in the entire writing. Yeah. 
That's fun. That's cool. I, I, then, I get, then I get to say later that I did it, which yeah. makes me kind of like edgy. I, I now that you mentioned, I that, participated I in the system by voting for a communist. Yes, that's I, I. I think I engage in the same way. I walk proudly to my my polling station. Yep. I vote for one of the major three parties. I walk proudly back <laughs> and I call my mom. I did, mom. <laughs> I call. I do it like that. Shoulders out. <laughs> and I look at that. Good I, job, I, son. <laughs> but I participated I, in your civic duty. But I look at that and I just think it's pure. That's pure and meaningful. Try to be. I look at that and I think I wish I could do that as I flip my coin. Oh, PPC. <laughs> <laughs> oh, communism today. <laughs> oh, jeez. So, um, well, you never answered the question. I think maybe that's a good, that's a good way to cap it. You never answered the question. How do you find how do you find meaning? I think you're you're about to, you're like I only can speak about me personally. But then we went on to something else. Mm, yeah, where you find meaning and why you haven't killed yourself. Yeah, I get personal. I kind of find the question to not be sensible. <laughs> what makes you happy? What makes you? I don't know. How, what, what accomplishing makes, tasks. Accomplishing tasks. Accomplishing tasks. Like you That's said, going to the gym. I fucking hate the gym. I hate it. Like every. Dude, I got my three three or four day a week routine and I hate the entire day because I have to go to the gym. I don't know why people find this to be fun. I do it so I don't have a heart attack at 50, hmm. but it's not fun. Accomplishing tasks that are like self-directed and it doesn't matter what they're... Like I like painting too. Yeah. Got a bunch of paintings on Instagram. Yeah. I like finishing a YouTube video. I like putting up a podcast. Can I show him the Destiny painting? Nah, it's just too much work. It's too much work. To take it off? Yeah, take it off. Yeah. Forget about it. Um, is it a painting or is it charcoal? Charcoal. Charcoal. Yeah, so just, just accomplishing, getting things done. Self so self-directed task accomplishment. Yeah. Taking something, doing it, completing it. Thumbs up. But this isn't something that I had to figure out, like, and then post on fucking Instagram. Be like, follow my productivity plan. It's just something that I realize if I've accomplished, if I don't have like a bookend to a task in a day, I'm kind of depressed or depressive. Yeah. Like working on <laughs> <laughs> the omni liberal. The smartest guy. I'm the smartest guy. He saw working it and then didn't, didn't say anything. I was pissed. Working on a PhD thesis is like so demoralizing for that reason because you work for like five years on one task and then you feel good about yourself and then that's it. <laughs> yeah. So I like the small, I like, I like weekly, weekly accomplishments or something like that rather than biting off more than I can chew. Like, how am I going to change the world in the next five years? Yeah. It's just, it's just that simple. It doesn't need to be intellectualized or deconstructed or it's just that simple. Yeah. And if you like theory, then look into it because it's fun. I think that's, I think that's great. Yeah. You, you, you brought a full horseshoe there. Full horseshoe. Wait, what's the beginning of the horseshoe? Uh, it's up for interpretation. We can't, we can't define it. That would be autistic. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> it changes, it changes episode to episode. So we've accomplished nothing, and that's okay. Yeah. People, people now know that um, systems theory is a thing, and that completing tasks makes you happy personally. Have you heard of cybernetics? I have. Like, not implant. Oh, yeah. You, we're named after the CCRU, <laughs> apparently. Yeah, but... The second word of there is cybernetics. Yeah, but we're going off a of vibe. I know what it is, but... <laughs> so cybernetics is, like, the precursor to systems theory. Yeah, I was about to say systems theory sounds very cybernetics-y. Yeah. Cybernetics is like first order, and then systems theory is like this, the study of systems systemically. Hmm. Uh, okay, before we cop it off, I, I wanted to ask, uh, do, you have like, do you have like a vision of the future? Do you think you know where the future is headed. The same, but a little bit worse. Okay. You mean like wor world history future? Yeah, our future. Yeah, same, same, but a little bit worse. Yeah. 
All right. Good answer. Yeah, I, I, I agree with that. <clears throat> Probably feel the same way. I don't think anyone wants that to be their personal future. They want their personal future to be the same, but a little bit better. Yeah. But systems, man. 